Dennis King uh, with the Humanitarian Information Unit at the uh, Department of State. And I'd like to talk about a prototype project, pilot project that we've been developing in cooperation with uh, our friends at Nigel uh, on conflicts without borders and using uh, Google Earth uh, visualization as an interface. Um, I've been working for the United Nations and the State Department and USAID and I've been working in conflict uh, research and early warning for a very long time in various sort of interagency groups. And all of these sort of groups have uh, watch lists of countries that are fragile states or conflict affected. And normally I would come across maps where they would color in and shade in the entire country as being conflict affected. And this sort of way of looking at conflict on a global scale in terms of early warning sort of reinforces the way of um, looking at con through conflict through the nation state lens, rather than looking at it, as we all know, as um, subnational and transnational, the nature of conflict is uh, localized and it crosses borders. So after seeing all of these uh, maps for a very long time where they would color in the entire country of Russia because Chechnya was affected, uh, I thought about mapping conflict at a subnational and a transnational level. So um, when we st started doing this uh, two years ago, uh, starting in the Horn of Africa, and when you look at conflict in the Horn of Africa, you see that conflict is really, there are eight or nine conflicts in the Horn of Africa. Then they cross borders, uh, going into refugee camps and rebel bases, and they're localized in, um, in the country. They're subnational, and so it, there were eight or nine conflicts in Kenya, in uh, East Africa during um, 2008. So what we did was we defined the conflicts, uh, red as being armed conflicts, where it was sort of a conflict against a government uh, and an, insurg an armed insurgent group. Um, orange, which were more sort of intercommunal strife conflicts uh, between tribes or between clans or between religious groups or ethnic groups. And then the yellow conflicts, which were sort of triggered by political events, things like elections or uh, political strikes or those types of things. So we categorized conflict according to that. We also uh, got the piracy incident data uh, from UNISAT and plotted that off the coast of um, Somalia by the X's and also put down some um, targeted attacks which were more or less sort of a terrorist attacks against um, targeted buildings and tar um, assassinations and IED uh, types of attacks represented by the uh, little red cherry bombs. So, and just to show you what we did with the, um, how we did this, we took the uh, incident data and we used a lot of open source incident data from Yushahidi and from a lot of the uh, organizations in this room and we plotted that on the map and then we also took where internally displaced persons were congregated and concentrated in the country, as well as where the refugee camps were on the outside cross borders and uh, rebel bases cross borders. And then we just drew a polygon around those areas. And we, in 2008, we put out a, uh, two different maps showing roughly, uh, I forget, 20, 20 so uh, conflicts throughout the um, African continent and showing sort of them subnational and transnational and giving some background information in the uh, table that you can't read. Um, so anyway, we published this map and then this guy named Patrick Meyer contacted me and said, hey, can you give me the shape files of these uh, polygons you got? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we uh, sent uh, Patrick the uh, shape files, and I believe he turned them over to uh, Nigel, and they created a, put it on a Google Earth interface. And so we were able to put these polygons onto a Google Earth interface, 
which allowed us to zoom in and pan and select layers and um, all the sort of features of, uh, of Google Earth. Uh, so this is the way it looked, uh, our first uh, effort. And then we were able, they were able to put the contextual textual information about each conflict, giving the background, the severity of the uh, particular emergency. So you could click on a point in the polygon and up would come this pop-up text box giving people background on the uh, particular conflict. Uh, and then showing you can turn on and off layers. You could, uh, you know, just ask for the armed conflicts or the intercommunal strifes. Uh, you could select uh, ones by date, um, including the definitions that we used uh, for defining the conflicts. Uh, and then another thing we did was uh, using the outlines of the conflict, you could turn either having it completely shaded or just showing the outline because we were interested in being able to zoom in to find out what's going on underneath that conflict affected area because we were very interested in what, if you look at it as subnational or transnational in nature, you can sort of examine the relationship between conflict and the environment, conflict and topography, conflict and natural resources. And again, as you zoom in, you could uh, click on the box and uh, up would come some t contextual information about that particular conflict. Um, we also put in a time um, scale slider so that you could sort of uh, show that the uh, conflicts uh, have, some are long term, uh, but some have a very short duration, such as uh, intercommunal, uh, intercommunal strife and uh, political violence types of conflicts. Uh, so this is our animation showing that using the Google Earth uh, interface, you can see how conflicts are expanding and contracting, how the areas of conflict uh, change, uh, and giving it a more interactive um, analysis so that people can look at the relationship between conflict and the rainy season, the relationship between conflict and political developments. Uh, so all types of um, temporal analysis that you could do uh, showing a relationship with conflict. Uh, another example is zooming in, being able to show how, the, again, the conflict is expanding and contracting over time. Um, and how these areas are not static, but they're dynamic and moving around. And I think one of the things that's come out of this conference is that uh, a lot of the collaboration and uh, the Humanitarian Information Unit has been working with a lot of groups, a lot of the groups that are here, uh, groups in the United Nations, the NGO community, and the academic community. And I think we're moving into a uh, uh, concept where no one organization takes credit for everything, but it's a very joint and uh, partnership um, efforts and activities. Uh, thank you. <laughs>